when people join the 1632 community on Baines Bar, fairly often they have to be disabused of um, things like, well, this is a this this is feudalism, or things like that. And Virginia DeMars, who is one of the series major authors, is going to talk about how time passed in the past. All right. I have given some I version of a talk with this title at every mini-con that we've held. It never has the same content. In other words, the title remains with us, but the content changes from time to time. I want to start out this time with uh, Paula's blurb in which she says, there were no knights in shining armor. True. There were, however, still cavalrymen in black armor. Uh, you will find that many of the military leaders of the period chose to have themselves portrayed wearing their cavalryman's black armor. Uh, Duke Bernhardt of Saxe Weimar, who comes up frequently in the story, every one of his official portraits was in his everyday working black armor, because that's how he wanted himself to portray himself as a military leader, a general, a cavalry officer. His brother, Duke Ernst, who also comes up in the series, interestingly enough, uh, who in his later life really did become the major educational reformer that he has shown as in the series, chose to have himself portrayed officially in a black scholar's gown with the little lace-trimmed cravat that was of modest dimensions suited to a scholar. In other words, we are here in a time period when among the other aspects of modernity that is very strong is that the leadership of Europe was very familiar with the concept of public relations. They hired <coughs> professional PR people. This is not an American innovation. They knew how to do it already, and the experts, the specialists, were already present, available, and willing to hire themselves out for suitable remuneration to <laughs> any client of whichever perspective who wanted to pay them for the job. These guys worked to a great extent on commission. Very few of them uh, worked out of a series of sense of loyalty to the person on whose behalf they were writing. So you have the fascinating aspect of this period in which I like to think of it as at the stage. <laughs> if you picture the medieval world as an egg. This is the stage at which modernity has already pecked its way through and is sticking its head out. But modernity is still trying to function in many ways inside the shell of the historical past which is why you find, if any of you were here yesterday evening when I was talking about land use, that real estate in the Germanies in this period was a buyer and seller market, a free market. After the sale was done, the lawyers drew up a contract which 
covered that sale within the wordage of feudal tenure. Uh, so that in theory, after somebody had paid somebody else 200 florins for a lot, the local ruler's chancery would issue a document assuring the world that the buyer now held this lot in tenure from so-and-so under the following conditions. It's a world in which, in theory, the nobles still did owe knight service to the rulers, but knights were totally obsolete. However, since in theory they owed the knight service, and in fact, because they owed the knight service, in theory, noble land, not noble people, but noble land, was exempt from ordinary taxation. The noble houses of the various German territories, estates, had to get together every now and then and vote subsidies to the ruler in lieu of knight service, because nobody wanted knight service, Nobody needed knight service, but still, in theory, all they owed was knight service, so they had to come up with an alternative approach to it. It's an interesting period in that all sorts of inherited crusts were cracking, but they hadn't been shed yet. They were just sitting around. And this leads to such things as yesterday morning when somebody said, during the Thirty Years' War, various fiefdoms were fighting one another, that I issued a pained and agonized owl because uh, there wasn't a decent fiefdom uh, left anywhere in Europe at this point. Which doesn't mean that in some ways, what you might call the driblets and drablets of fiefdoms might not be significant. Uh, if any of you have ever heard Eric talk about early modern Germany, the complexity of it drives him nuts. Uh, and I have had to go to some pains to explain to them that in the near neighbors of the arrival of Grandville, the Schwarzburgs, which were divided into two lines of schwarzburg Rudelstadt and schwarzburg Sondershausen, uh, the Count of schwarzburg Rudelstadt. Ludwig Günther shows up in the series quite a bit. At the time, of, in the real world, he was known as the Solomon of Rudelstadt. <laughs> now, Rudelstadt only had about a thousand people in it, so being the Solomon of Rudelstadt didn't take a tremendous amount of mental power. But the fact remains that he was, in fact, a very well-educated man. Uh, he had never expected to become the Count. He was well down in the line of brothers, and as a young man, he had basically become something of a scholar. He had spent a couple of years at Oxford. He had spent a couple of years in Italy. He'd gone to France. He'd traveled around. And then when it became perfectly clear that none of the marriages of his older brothers were going to be fruitful. That they not only didn't have sons, they didn't have daughters either. They didn't have children at all. And the wives were hitting their 50s. They all looked at one another and said, well, Lutz, old boy, it looks like it's up to you. At which point, he acquired a sensible young woman in her mid-20s who was pretty thoroughly on the shelf and begat a new supply of heirs. But he was, in fact, a sensible, 
a man and negotiate her a practical man. But somebody looked at me and said, but this is ridiculous. Uh, Rudelstadt has some territory down here by Granville and other territory up there in the north of Thuringia. And Saundershausen has most of its territory up there in north of Thuringia, but it has a little bit down by Grantville. Why don't they just, you know, exchange the bits and consolidate? <laughs> <laughs> the American way. The American way. <laughs> Let's consolidate this uh, granite yes. school district. And I pointed out that the Schwarzburg family had been nobles in central Thuringia, going back to the mists of the Carolingian times, they'd been around as long as anybody. And that southern territory they held was allodial, which is a technical term known as it was not held as a thief from any ruler. They owned that land outright. They had as long as historical records ran, and they owed no allegiance to anybody for it. However, the northern part they held as a fief of the king of Bohemia and had since the 13th century. Who's the king of Bohemia? Huh, that's a good question. That's Albrecht a good question. von Wallerstein yeah, yes. at the moment. Mm -hmm. Does either of them want to give up his bit of the allodial land and only be a landholder at the will of the ruler of a foreign country? A duh. No. <laughs> like, duh. Of course he doesn't. Additionally, these guys are in a rather ticklish position. Who are the nearest big German nobles to Schwarzburg? The Vettines, Wilhelm Vettine, Bernhard, Ernst, and brothers. For how many centuries have the Vettines been trying to subjugate Schwarzburg and mediatize them from the empire and take away their direct immunities? Many centuries. What prevented it? That allodial land title the Vettines could not claim to subordinate somebody who held allodial land. In other words, these people are working in a certain legal context. And these people are not in the least unaware of possible legal consequences. And one legal consequence will be if this new USC experiment doesn't work, if at some point it collapses, where are we going to stand legally in relation to whatever successor organization shows up. And that means only over our dead bodies do we give up our part of the Avodio Schwarzburg land. Time passed in the past 